Well, let me ask a question today. Um, rhetorical. You know, the way this group is today, I know somebody might just say something, so I don't want you to say anything. All right. I want to keep control here. But um, what's the worst party you've ever been to? I mean, the absolute worst party that you've ever been to. We've all been to some bad parties, right? Worst party. Let, let me share mine with you. You can't share yours with me, but let me share mine with you, okay? I don't really have one in particular. It's a whole class of party. Um, and I was talking with Nine about this the other day, and what I, what, I, uh, what I came up with was a whole class of parties that happened when I was like in seventh and eighth grade. And uh, kids don't do this anymore, and that's probably a good thing, but when we were in seventh or eighth grade, you went to parties and you had to dance, and it wasn't like, you know, now kids just go out in a group and dance, and back then it was all up to the guy and the guy had to go up to a girl and say, would you dance with me? Or, you know, if he was real, yeah, to do that. You know, you have to go up and say, or, or like if you're really cool, you just kind of go up and grunt, you know, and she would know what you meant. And, and wow, the, the pressure. Can you imagine being a guy and being in seventh or eighth grade and having to approach a girl and ask her if she would? And you, Okay, here's the other thing. When we danced, we actually touched each other, you know because there's a lot of slow dancing and stuff like that. And I remember, you know, so like you would work on somebody, flirt with somebody all week to kind of set things up. So you kind of had some, you know, ideas to whether she would say yes or no. And then as the dance would start, you know, the, the, the first song would play and nobody would do anything. And then the second song and still by the third song, you know, some jerk would get up and dance. And that meant that you had to do that. You didn't want to get left with the guys that were standing over there on the wall, you know, the really nerdy guys, so you had to go ask somebody to dance. And I remember my hands would just like, you know, sweat would be dripping off my hands. And you're like wiping them on, you know, until your pants are wet, you know. And, and, and it just won't stop sweating because you had to touch her and she would know that you, you know, you were nervous. Do you sympathize with that? Do you see what I've gone through in my formation of who I am? Have you been to a party that bad? Or, or maybe, maybe you know, right now you're, you're thinking of some parties that you've gone to where, like, you know, the guy that's in the apartment building asks you if you would like to come to his party and you avoid him. I don't know. I think I got, I don't know. If, you know, I'll check. I'll, you know, and then, you know, he corners you and you got to go. And or maybe he says, oh, uh, this, he's got this cool guy that's going to come. You know, and that's always how we gauge as to whether we want to go to the party about, well, who's going to be there? You know, is anybody cool going to be, anybody better than me going to be there? And so he's, he says, well, JT is going to be there. And so you go, well, JT's okay, it's going to be all right. So then you go to the party and there's like six people and they've got, you know, like uh, big K soda and uh, stale chips and, and junk like that. And it's just nasty. And everybody's looking at their watch and where's JT? And JT never comes, right? Everybody's been to that kind of a party. It's like, how do I get out of here? Now it's a lot easier because, oh, oh, yeah, okay, I'll be right there. I got to go, guys. Something's happened. You know, you can always get a fake phone call. We're going to be talking about uh, parties today. And uh, for four weeks, we'll be talking about the kingdom of God. And it's this huge subject in the New Testament. Jesus talked about you know, the kingdom of God more than anything else. And some of us, we might not really know what the kingdom of God is. Well, the kingdom of God is really the world as God intended it. That's kind of my paraphrase. But that's really what he means, is the world as God intended it. When Jesus spoke of the kingdom, he meant the world where God is known and real, kind of like Adam and Eve walking with the Lord in the cool of the day. And in this world, the, the kingdom of God, there's peace and there's prosperity and there's no sickness and there is no pain. It's kind of like heaven on earth. And Jesus said that the kingdom is here. He said among us, but it's all not here yet. So it's kind of yes and not yet. You know, it's, it's here in part, but we're growing into this full kingdom of God when he returns. And remember that he, when asked how to, to pray, he said, pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. So we're in the midst of it but it's not here in its fullness. And Jesus was just all about the kingdom of God. And 
You know, more than anything else, he called himself son of man. And, and son of man, we think, well, he's referring to the fact that he was born of a woman. And that's really not what he's talking about. Son of a man, son of man is a title that is used back in Daniel 7 of this king, this new reign, this messianic figure that's going to come and, and really reconcile the whole world and put everything right, you know, kind of the world as God intends it. So when Jesus says son of man, in his context to the Jewish people, they know exactly what he's talking about. And we've been waiting for this guy to come. We've been waiting for the Son of Man to come and put things right because this world is a mess. So he talked about himself, uh, uh, about that a lot, and it would be a complete restoration. And then he used a lot of different metaphors, imagery, to talk about what the kingdom of God is. And we'll go through a few of these in the four weeks. We'll say the kingdom of God is like. And, and today we're talking about the kingdom of God is, is like a great banquet or a party. That's one imagery that he uses, is the kingdom of God is like a party. And that, that theme is uh, first introduced, although Tom did a good job of introducing it there in Deuteronomy, but the idea of a banquet feast is first introduced prophetically in Isaiah 25, 6, uh, where the, the prophet says, On this mountain the Lord of heavenly forces, and that's his son of man figure, will prepare for all peoples a rich feast, a feast of choice wines, of select foods and flavor of choice wines well refined. And then uh, I think of Jesus, where Jesus in Matthew 8, 11 said, I say to you that there are many who will come from east and west and sit down and eat with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. So the idea is of this banquet table is what the kingdom of God is like. And, of course, we think on to the book of Revelation with, with the marriage of the Lamb when uh, the, the king has come and everything is reconciled and there is this huge banquet and celebration. So the kingdom here is represented as a party. Don't you like this? As a banquet. I just think this is so cool that there's something in Scripture that talks about what God wants to do and it's a party. And we remember uh, that the first miracle that Jesus did was at a party. Remember this in John 2 where he, you know, is at this wedding feast and weddings go on for like three days of celebrating. And it's it's kind of like a field party on Memorial Day weekend type thing. And they go on for three days and they run out of wine and Jesus' mom says, you got to do something. We're out of wine. They're embarrassed. You know, this party's crashing. And Jesus takes these big jugs of water and turns them into wine. And some churches just love this. They go, see, you can, you can drink wine. Everybody can drink. It's fine. It's okay. Everybody can drink wine with their meals. See, Jesus did it. It's okay. And other churches go, no, it was Welch's grape juice is what he turned it into. All depending on which side of the fence that you are on this thing. But I think we really miss the meaning of why that... that that passage, why that miracle is even in Scripture, because it's this sign, you know? It's this sign, again, that Jesus is saying, the banquet, the kingdom is here. Look, it's okay. It's, and I'm the king, and I'm going to usher in this new time. And it points again to this metaphor of the kingdom of God being like a feast and like a party. Now, about right here is where uh, some people, um, not you guys, but some people usually become kind of uncomfortable with this whole thing, uh, the kingdom being like a party. It just seems all wrong to them and something that, you know, we're just kind of pushing it. And they'd like to think the kingdom of God is kind of like taking the SAT test, you know, or, uh, you know, having a couple root canals. or That's what the kingdom of God is like. It's, you know, yeah, take something away from you, do something to you to make you squirm and, and wish that, you know, this would be over with. And that's the way their whole concept is of, of God's action with human beings. I mean, it's a really sick concept. And they think of obedience as being, you know, well, just something that you do to, because God's putting this test out there and saying, well, let's, let's see who's really good or not. Will they obey these things? And, and, you know, judging people who don't obey these things and, you know, just no fun at all. In fact, if you, if you have too much fun, um, there must be something wrong with it. I used to know a guy that you'd say, how you doing? He says, eh, if I did any better, it'd be illegal. You know, the whole idea that if you really have fun, 
that there's got to be something wrong with that because God wouldn't want you to have any fun. I've had people through the years, uh, you know, I'm a whole lot funnier now than what I used to be. I know that's hard for you to believe, but uh, if, if I could be funnier, I would be funnier because I think humor is something that really belongs in church. But I've had people through the years be very critical. Uh, I, I remember when I was a young guy and I told a few jokes in the pulpit and I was reprimanded by some people who let me know that church was not a place to laugh. Church was a place where you came in and listened to somber music and you were really, really sorry for everything. And the sorrier you felt, the holier you were. And I wasn't helping them feel sorry enough so they weren't getting their holiness fix. I, you know, that, that's just so... But anyway... What I remember is things like out of uh, Nehemiah, that wonderful story out of Nehemiah 8, where uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, they, they find the Torah, they find the book of Moses, and they're trying to, they're, they're doing, you know, like they've been in exile, and they come back to Israel, and they're going through the old temple, and they find the book, and they haven't found this book, they haven't had God's word for hundreds of years, and they find it, and they start reading it, and all the people start crying, and they're like, what? This is so fantastic. And, and Ezra and Nehemiah said, hey, don't cry. This is not a day of mourning. This is a day of joy. And then there's that, that passage there, Nehemiah, uh, at the end of this, I think it's Nehemiah 8.12, and it says, the sorrow of the Lord will be your strength. Or excuse me, that's the way we read it. The joy of the Lord will be your strength, right? But many people have read that to be the sorrow of the Lord will be your strength. Now, this point of the kingdom being like a party is taught by Jesus. It's uh, in Luke 14. Uh, we're going to knock around there for a little bit. And uh, when, when you get there, you notice that the context of this is a party. Jesus has been invited to a party with some very rich Pharisees, and they're sitting at table, and he instructs them while they're there. And he gives them this parable. It's, on, it's Luke 14, 16 to 24. Uh, Jesus replied, A certain man hosted a large dinner and invited many people. When it was time for the dinner to begin, he sent his servant to tell the invited guests, Come, the dinner is now ready. One by one, they all began to make excuses. The first one told him, I bought a farm and must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I bought five teams of oxen and I'm going to check on them. Please excuse me. Another said, I just got married so I can't come. When he returned, the servant reported these excuses to his master. The master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go quickly to the city streets, the busy ones, and the side streets, and bring the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. The servant said, Master, your instructions have been followed, and there's still room. The master said to the servant, Go to the highways and the back alleys and urge people to come in so that my house will be filled. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will taste my dinner. Now, first thing that we notice is that everybody's invited here. Nobody gets left out. So uh, occasionally we'll have people that say, well, you know, I, I'm really done with church, I'm really done with God because I did something back in 09 that was so bad, and, you know, I tried it for a while. It just, just didn't work. And, you know, God, it's just, we're done. Our relationship's over because I just screwed things up so bad. And, and we, we notice here that, first of all, everybody uh, is invited. Now, um, you know, if you want to have a good party, you invite some important people, right? You invite some JTs. You invite people that are fun. And you, you want to invite, I think, people that are just a little cooler than you are. A little bit more connected and if you can just find one person that everybody knows is really that guy or girl then other people want to come because they'll know that they're there right that's the way that we do things with parties so a little bit more connected a little bit more famous a little bit more money but you don't want to invite people that are too wealthy because then they probably won't come and if they do come they're gonna look at your digs and look at your big K and go this just stinks this party is not nothing I'm leaving I got something, so then that kind of messes things up. That's how we do party. 
But in the parable, Jesus just describes a different kind of guest list for a different kind of party. First off, he invites some well-to-do people, right? In this parable, uh, he, he invites some people who, you know, one guy just bought some land. He's a landowner. Another guy bought five yoke of oxen, <laughs> which may not impress you much, but, I mean, that's, that's a substantial purchase. He wants to go try his five oak out yoke out, you know, 10 ox. And another guy's got, you know, just been married. So he's obviously got some status, enough money to get married. So uh, he does not uh, have anything against the connected, against the wealthy, against the famous. They need Jesus just as much as anyone else. But since they don't come, then others get invited. He invites the poor, the lame, the sick, the blind, the homeless. He says, get everybody here. Invite Everyone, he says, I'm not just inviting the winners, I'm inviting the losers because I'm having a party. Now, hear that. Everybody's invited. Everybody. There, there are no class distinctions here. He doesn't leave the wealthy out, the one percenters, because they've abused their money. No, he, he invites everybody to the party. Everyone gets an invitation. And I think that Jesus teaches us this, that first of all, his invitation is not just for some but it's for all. And second, the invitation requires a complete reprioritization of life. There are no excuses. There are just things that block us. Back then, the banquet invitation was a two-stage thing. It's not like it is today. Uh, the first stage of the invitation was that uh, he would send guests out, and they would say, you know, so-and-so, JT's having a big party, and he wants you to come. Will you come? And you go, yeah, 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 I, I'll come. But you don't know when. So then he goes back, and he tells the host back in those days, and the host would go out and, you know, um, put the pig in the pit, or that they probably wouldn't be doing that. Um, uh, get some lobster? No, they probably wouldn't be doing that either, would they? Uh, but anyway, they would prepare this big feast, and then when it was ready, then they'd send the messengers out again and say, okay, come on, it's, it's ready, you know. And, and then, you know, that was a two-stage invitation. And so they would come and, uh, you know. So why do they say no? You know, people read this and they say, you know, those are pretty good excuses. <laughs> I just bought some ground. I, I got some new oxen. I was just married. Man, those are good excuses. And it's... You know, people read this and they say, those are good. It's not like this was the only party or the host was the only host. And I mean, are, are you missing this? It's, this is about kingdom. Uh, the invitations are sent out by the king. The invitations are sent out by the son of man, the one who's going to restore everything. And he wants you to come. But they don't come because they've got other stuff. They've got other things to do. And he wants you to come, but... You know, it would force them to change their lives around. And he wants you to come right now, but, you know, I can come tomorrow. If, you're still, if the party's still going, I think I can make it tomorrow. Let me, let me ride the oxen around for a while, and then I'll be there, you know. But uh, they like the idea. They want to come, but it's just, you know, there's just other things to do. I think the more power that we have on our own, the more power that's focused around the center of this, this culture, the less that we like the, the gospel. The more that we are able, the less the gospel appeals to us. The, the more we have, the more power, the more ability, the more fame, the more popularity, um, the less the gospel appeals to us. And the gospel is less appealing when we're fine. And, of course, the gospel is, is that God loves us, so he gave his son in atonement for our sins, to reconcile us to himself. And, you know, if we're doing okay, and if, we, if, we're, if we're very empowered, and everything's going real well, and we, we're having parties of our own, then it's like, you know, I know it's all about my sin, but my sin's just not that bad. It's just, you know, I, I know that I'm not, I'm not perfect, but it's just not that bad. And uh, a few things here and there, but... You know, I'm better than average, so this gospel thing, it's nice, but it's not urgent. This party is for the poor. The kingdom belongs 
to the poor in spirit. There's another passage, Matthew 5, 3 in the Beatitudes. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Same as the kingdom of God. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Another translation says, happy are people who are hopeless because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Isn't that a strange statement? Outside of this, if you were just read this, happy are those who are hopeless because theirs is the, the kingdom of heaven. I mean, but it makes sense because the only way that we get this kingdom is if we're poor in spirit, if we become hopeless. The party is for the hopeless, those, those who aren't say, ah, I don't think, you know, I, I need that party. I don't think I can make it. I've got other things. I, I want to come, really. Trust me, I want to come. And, and, you know, I'm having a party next week. Tell JT I'd really like to have him come to mind. But, you know, I've got these arrangements and I've got these things to do. And, you know, it's just not that big. Reality is I can have my own party, right? I don't need to go to somebody else's feast. I'm making my own party. I uh, don't need to go. The kingdom of God belongs to the poor in spirit. They come to the party. They need the radical change of the kingdom of God. And they can't wait to see things made new. Uh, they're, they're, they drop everything that they've got when they hear the news. But if we have great ability and great power and we've invested in this world, then we're really not so sure that we're that nuts about it. Can, can we do it on my schedule, see? There's poor in spirit, and then there's middle class in spirit. <laughs> And boy, it's just a lot easier to be middle class in spirit. Don't we all want to be just middle class in spirit? How many of us want to be poverty of spirit? The middle class in spirit know that they're not perfect. Uh, they need God, but their need for change is just not that urgent. Now, the original listeners to this were the wealthy religious leaders. They didn't uh, want to go to the party. They thought they could have their own party. They had things all worked out. They did some good things. They helped a few people. They went to temple twice a day. They washed their hands at the right times. They read Korah. They ate kosher. It was working for them. And they don't even give an RSVP. See, they don't even reply. They just throw the invitation over there in the junk mail stack. But the poor in the spirit, they get it. Wow. I'm invited to his party. I never thought that God would invite me to his party. I need this grace. They know they need change. They understand they need this new core, this new center. They know that life has got to be have a radical change. And they're just so excited about going, you know, you can middle class yourself to death, I think. And, and you can also tomorrow yourself into never. You, you can avoid being hopeless and poor to the degree that you end up with nothing. And that's what Jesus is trying to tell them and trying to tell us. Now, it's a party that compels us to reach out to others, to invite others. And the really cool thing um, about this party is that since everyone is invited, the, the guests are urged to tell other people and invite them as well. He says, I want you to come to my party, be a part of my kingdom, and I want you to bring someone else. Just like we, we would to a party. You can bring a guest, is what God's telling us. We'd say, well, who? I mean, who is worthy to come to this party? And he says, well, I invited you, didn't I? So that means about anybody could come, right? You just find some more people kind of like yourself, you know, poor and hopeless and don't have a prayer. Those kind of people, that's who I want in my party. Previously in verse 12, right before this parable, he was sitting at this banquet with these rich Pharisees, and he tells them something that uh, I think goes with this. It's Luke 14, 12 to 13. Jesus said to the person who had invited him, when you host a lunch or dinner, don't invite your friends, your brothers and sisters, your relatives or rich neighbors. If you do, they will invite you in return, and that will be re your reward. Instead, when you give a banquet, invite the poor, crippled, lame, and blind. <laughs> this is to us, to give us the guest list of God. I mean, he says, invite people to my party, salvation, that no one else wants. That's who you invite. There's your mission field. Now, this world lived in a class system, 
much more rigid than ours. Uh, we, we know that if you're an immigrant to America and your grandfather worked hard and his son perhaps got a high school education and then that grandson probably got a college education. But in their day, if you were poor, you stayed poor. There was no way out of it. Nobody moved up the ladder of economics back then. And the only advancement could come would be if you had some connections with some other people. If you happened to be invited to a banquet that was way over your head, but somehow you got into this banquet and you met some people and they helped you out a little bit. Connections. And Jesus said, don't do that. Don't invite people for connections. Don't invite people with whom you can make connections to help your career. It's not about networking in the kingdom of God, he says. Jesus says, go after the stranger. No strategic advantage to them at all. Invite the poor in the spirit, the poor in the world as well. So here we have revealed the evangelism plan for the gathering. All right? Go out and find some losers like yourselves and invite them to church. Come on, that's funny. No, that's not funny. Really. He says, invite some people who would normally not get an invitation. And that should be our evangelism plan. And, and you know, we, we talk about this all the time. We go, man, they'd make a good member. And they would. Wouldn't they make a good member? Boy, if we could get them to come. And Jesus says, eh, invite the people that wouldn't make good members. Invite the people that nobody wants in their church. See? Invite them because they are the seed bed for the gospel. They are the real poor in spirit. They are the hopeless ones. They're the ones that's going to grab onto this and go, oh, man, this is everything. You say, that's a weird church. Yeah, I know. And you say, well, that won't work. Uh, you're not going to have any influential people. You're not, you're not going to have anybody that anybody respects. As a matter of fact, unless God does something in that church, it'll never, never, do, yeah, start to get the whole idea. Unless God does something. Antoine Fisher, I don't know if you saw that movie or not. It's a true story. Um, it was uh, produced by Denzel Washington. It didn't do real well in the box office. It was a great story about a young man who was given up uh, at uh, birth by his mother who was incarcerated. And he has this terrible experience in life where he goes through uh, orphanages and bad foster homes, and he's abused. And I mean, he just, he's a poor guy. Just really has a rough time because he's abandoned by his, given up for adoption by his mother. And he has a rough stay in, in the Navy, and he's, he's got some problems. And when he's 18, he, he seeks out this original mother, and he finds out that he's got family that's living in Cleveland. And he contacts an aunt and an uncle, and they, they say, yes, your mother is now out of jail, and she's over here. And he makes that trip, and he, and he finds his mom, and she's in this really bad apartment, and she's a mess still. And Antoine comes in and, and he asks her, you know, he, he needs to know why she gave him up. And, you know, to kind of reconcile everything, um, what's happened in his, in his life. But uh, she uh, doesn't really talk to him. She goes into another room and sits on this old couch and just kind of motionless, no tears, no motion. And as he is trying to ask her, you know, for some reason, she just has no emotion, just stares off. And Antoine, you know, kisses her and says, I forgive you, which is kind of his try to try to reconcile. And he walks away and he goes out of the house and you just feel like, man, you know, my heart really goes out to the true story. My heart really goes out to this guy who's rejected by his mother. And um, he gets in the car with his uncle. And they drive back over to his aunt and uncle's place. And as he gets, gets there, um, uh, things change just immediately because the despair of this 18-year-old boy that no one's ever loved. And he walks into his aunt and uncle's house, and there are 50 people waiting for him. And I mean, it's cousins and friends and aunts and uncles and children, and, and they all 
hug him and kiss him and pat him on the back and, oh, welcome home, Antoine, welcome home. And they just, just love to see him so much. And, and a cousin tells him that his name is Edward and he was named after Antoine's dad. And he didn't know that. And then an older aunt squeezes his cheeks and he's just overwhelmed. I mean, walking into this family. He didn't even know he had a family. And on the, on the stairs, there's some kids, and they've, you know, with crayons, made rainbows. that said, we love you, Antoine, and welcome home, Antoine. And, I mean, it's just a wonderful scene. And then he's, he's led into the, the dining room, and there's this huge table that's laid out with all this food on it. There's mashed potatoes and chicken and just all this, uh, you know, the jello salads and just everything, pancakes, everything you can imagine for a meal is laid out on this huge table, and they're going to have a feast. They're going to have a big family meal for Antoine. And for the first time in his life, he is being loved. First time in his life, he's being adored. And for the first time in his life, he's being, he, he really belongs. And things quiet down, and there's an elderly woman, woman sitting at the table, and she knocks on the table to get everybody's attention, and she, she beckons him over, and this is his grandmother. And... She, she grabs his hand and then, and then she puts her hand up on his cheek. And as one tear comes down her face, he says, "Welcome home." And I mean, it's just one of the most, you know, heartfelt scenes that you could you could ever see. And it's you know, um, much the same way. We're, we're all welcomed into the family of God. And. The more abused we've been, the more neglected that we've been, the more uh, rejected that we've been, the easier it is to come to the party. It, it really is. And if you're poor enough, if you're hopeless enough, and God says, I'm throwing you a party, and God sends us a personal invitation. Well, um, maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know, Don, um, I'm middle class. <laughs> I've not been rejected that much. I've been loved my whole life. Things have come easy for me. I've had a lot of help. And I'm not poor enough. I'm not hopeless enough. And um, I just ask us today, I know, you know, I know it's, uh, it's a terrible thing to be born into a loving family in a great place. Sarcasm alert. But my question is, we may be middle class in spirit, but do we want to be poor in spirit? Do we want to be dependent upon Jesus Christ? And the invitation goes out today. How do I get poor, Lord? How do I, how do I get on the inside of me that it, it's all about you and none of it's about me? Years ago, the old wedding vows, they don't do this anymore. But included in the book of prayer, the old wedding vow was the phrase, forsaking all others. And I thought, that's, isn't that a wonderful vow to say, I forsake all others for you when you make your promise for a life to someone. Nobody else is going to come between us. And, and, and that's where we need to be with God, is that, all others, no, no matter what it is, um, land, oxen, or even marriage, should come between us and the Lord's invitation to come to him, that we should forsake all others. And until we get to that place, we're not going to enjoy the party. We'll be looking at our watch, wondering how can I get out of here? When's JT coming? You know? But when, when we come to that place that I want to be poor in spirit, then send back that RSVP and we're ready to sit down at the banquet table with him and gives us, not tell him what. Well, today, friends, I'm not calling you out. I'm calling you in. Okay? It's constantly what we want to do. We want to welcome other people in. We want to call them into the kingdom. <clears throat> so let us take a few minutes. Um, let the Spirit teach us. Oh, who are 
thirsty Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out